that was a nice little song, wasn't it? Yeah. I tell you, if I could sing like that, I'd sing to myself. That's right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, thank you for letting me be here. And uh, when I pulled up, I saw all the cars. I said, wow, this big crowd's coming to hear me preach. And then I found out they were singing. I said, <laughs> I know where they're, why they're here. All right. It sure is good to be with you. Take your Bibles and turn with me very quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and in just a moment I'll read verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. And uh, my wife and I just got back from a vacation, and we uh, just both turned 60, and uh, we uh, went to Hawaii. And uh, I know, Gerald, you were there uh, right before we were, and uh, because every time I would put something out on social media, he'd said, I've been there. <laughs> I'd put something out, he said, I was there too. And, uh, but it's a beautiful place, is it not? I mean, boy, it, uh, it was beautiful. And while I was there, I gained one pound for every day I was there. <laughs> and I was there two weeks. I went from 225 to 240. I am that guy that was 6'4", 240, all right? <laughs> Who, but I was not the guy motivating you that day, all right? I weighed 240 this morning. I got to get back down. And one of, the, one of the, my motivations for losing weight, uh, I've been on steroids, uh, uh, been on uh, uh, medicine. I have a thing called myasthenia gravis, and I've been taking uh, prednisone for about... Uh, almost 20 years, and uh, it's kind of hard. If you don't know anything about prednisone, it will make you jump flat-footed over your house <laughs> while you're eating a Sonic burger, all right? <laughs> and so uh, I, I uh, have really uh, been uh, fine. I, was, I weighed about 230 forever, and then I got up to about 280, and I said, I, I can't do any more of this. So I started losing weight, and I got down to about 225, but while I was there, I... I jumped, but I, I'm coming back down. Don't worry about it. But uh, my, one of my motivators is this. How many of you ever need motivation? Anybody out there need motivation? Well, I have three other guys, and uh, we text our weight to each other every morning. Now, some of y'all can't handle that, all right? I mean, you, you're already out. You think, you know, well, I, I just don't think that's of God. Well, I don't know whether it's of God or not. But we do it. And we don't just text. A lot of times we make comments. And that's the part that you really couldn't handle, all right? But it motivates me. And so I, I, I know that, uh, you know, I want to get down where I used to be when I played football. And uh, I need motivation. I want to say this to you. There, there's some, some people here tonight that need some motivation in the area of witnessing. You know, the two most important things, I think, in the Christian life are prayer and evangelism. Uh, and that's why the devil fights those things so hard. Because when you pray, there's something about prayer. Uh, when you pray, God does things when you pray that he doesn't do when you don't pray. I mean, if not, why pray? I mean, you don't pray just to acquiesce to some predetermined plan. You pray because God will do things that he would not have done had you not prayed. And so Jesus wants us to pray and the Bible tells us to pray. And I believe that if you love somebody, you talk with them, do you not? I mean, if you don't talk to somebody, don't tell me you love them. If you never talk to your wife, you never talk to your kids, you never talk to somebody, don't go around saying you love them. If you love somebody, you talk with them. And you don't just talk with them, you talk about them in a good way, do you not? Well, what is that? That's evangelism. That's telling people about Jesus. So if you never tell anybody about Jesus, do you really love Jesus? Do you, if, if you never talk to Jesus, if you don't want to talk to Jesus, do you really love Jesus? And if you don't want to talk about Jesus, do you really love him? Now, I'm not trying to put any guilt on you or anything like that. I'm just trying to tell you it makes perfect sense. I'm a simple guy from a little town called Dyersburg, Tennessee, but I get it. If you love somebody, you talk with them and you talk about them. 
I've got 12 grandbabies. I'll talk to you all day about my grandbabies. I've got a wife I've been married to 38 years and she is still good looking. Ain't no woman like the one I got. That's right, man. So I'm just telling you, I got that from Fred Luter is where I got that, by the way. But I'm just telling you, I love her. I've talked to her five times on the phone today. I just saw her last night. She's been, her daddy had surgery. She had spent the night at the hospital. I love my wife. I talk with her and I talk about her. Why? Because I love her. And if you love Jesus, that's what you're going to do as well. So I want to say to you, I want to talk to you a little bit about some motivation for telling people about Jesus. Gospel motivation. Say that with me. Gospel motivation. Paul had some motivation. Notice what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. If I sing the gospel, if I preach the gospel, if I share the gospel, I don't have anything to brag about because it's not about me. The gospel is from God and it's all about Jesus Christ. So I got nothing to boast about. For I am under compulsion. Everybody say compulsion. I'm under compulsion. Then he says, woe is me if I do not preach or share the gospel. Father, in the name of Jesus, in these few moments that we have together, I pray that you would motivate us to tell people one-on-one -on -one about Jesus. And if that's your prayer, say amen. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And he's writing to them because he loved that church. That church was really the first time, one of the major times that God poured out his spirit. And it was an unlikely time and an unlikely place. Paul was on a missionary journey and while he was in a little place called Troas, I've been there a couple of times, and he, he had this vision from a man from Macedonia over in what we would call modern day Europe and this guy was saying, come over and help us. And so Paul believed that they were supposed to go and they went, they went to Philippi and it went okay. They were talking with some ladies out there and a lady named Lydia, God opened her heart up and she received Jesus as Lord and Savior. She said, why don't you guys come to my house? She had a big house, she was a wealthy woman and she sold uh, purple fabric and other things. And so they started a church right there in Philippi and soon Paul got to lead a demonized woman with the spirit of python literally in, in her and she was telling fortunes and he cast that demon out and the Bible says that he was beaten in public along with Silas, thrown into jail and you remember what happened. She got saved but Paul and Silas went to jail but, and they were singing at midnight with their backs lacerated and their feet in stocks. They were singing. It's real easy to sing when you got these great singers here but would you sing in the jail as well? And so they were singing at midnight and the Bible says the prisoners were listening, but guess what? God was listening too. And all of a sudden the whole jail started to shake and the, the chains fell off and the jailer, a former Roman soldier, a big crusty guy was about to kill himself, but he didn't do it because Paul cried out, stop, everything's okay, we're still here. And he fell at their feet and says, what must I do to be saved. And the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And they led him to Christ right there. So there were some good things that happened, but then they got run out of town after they started the church in Philippi. They go to Thessalonica and the Jews embrace them at first. And then they start getting jealous because this Paul is, is seeing more people converted to Christianity than they are seeing to, the, to Judaism. And so they run him out of town after he starts a church. He goes to a little place called Berea. They're more noble-minded, the Bible says, and they're reading the scriptures, examining to see if what Paul was saying was true. And all of a sudden, the people from Thessalonica come. They found out that, that Paul was there, and they run him out of Berea as well. He starts a church there, and he goes down to Athens. And what's going to happen in Athens? It's a very intellectual place. The intelligentsia was there, all the aristocrats. And so Paul's just out on the street corner telling people about Jesus. And the Bible says some guys, some of the Stoic philosophers came up and they said, would you come to talk with us on Mars Hill? Would you come and talk to the, the most, uh, the, the, the Dionysius, the people that would, would be the, the smartest people in all of Greece? And he goes up there on Mars Hill. I've been there a couple of times and, and he preached to them. And some of those people got saved 
and he then leaves. So, so he's had some success along the way, but he comes to Corinth, a place that had two ports. It was a seafaring city. It had all kinds of immorality. It was located on an isthmus. An isthmus is a little piece of land between two seas. And on the north and on the south, there was a sea. There was all kinds of immorality. And if you wanted to call somebody in that day, somebody immoral, if you want to call them immoral, you called them a Corinthian. And Paul was there. And he's, one, he's probably discouraged. He's probably tired. But God gave him a promise Acts 18, verses 9 through 11, the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, don't be afraid any longer, but go on speaking. Don't be silent, for I'm with you. John Wesley said, the greatest thing of all is that God is with us. I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in the city. Nobody had been saved, but God could see the future as well as he could see the present and the past. And God said, I want you to know that I've got many people in this city. A lot of folks are going to get saved. Isn't that awesome? And the Bible says he settled there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And all kinds of people got saved. And so Paul is writing to these people and he's writing in chapter 9, one of the greatest texts in all of the Bible. He, he, he goes on to say, you know, uh, to the Jews I became, in this text, he, he said, to the Jews I became a Jew that I might win the Jews to the Gentiles I became like a Gentile that I might win the Gentiles I do all things for the sake of the gospel and then he's trying to explain to them why he did not take an offering from their church he took it from Philippi to minister at their church for some reason he didn't want to have the Corinthians pay him he and while he was trying to explain all that in the midst of all that he says for if I preach the gospel I don't have anything to brag about I have nothing to boast of for you see, guys, I'm not a hireling. I don't do it for the money. I don't do it for anything else. I am under compulsion. It's like this. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Where have I heard that? Oh, yeah. That Old Testament guy that Jesus quoted all the time named Jeremiah. Chapter 20, verse 9. But if I say I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in. When he wrote to the Romans, Paul said, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, that is to everybody. So in, as for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel. I'm under obligation I've got fire in my bones. I have a compassion in me. That word compassion is a very interesting word, but uh, also uh, uh, compulsion is an interesting word. I, I want to say this what it is. Compulsion, did anybody ever have a washing machine from Sears and Roebuck back in the 1960s? Anybody out there besides my house? My mother didn't work at Sears. She worked at Sears and Roebuck. And she bought a washer, and it had this agitator in it. And we had this den back there with this. Th this washing machine had an attitude is what it did, all right? <laughs> and she would turn that thing on, and it would start going. Are you ready? And I said, what's, what's going on? The gains are just washing their clothes. That's all that's going on. There was an agitator in it. That's the word for compulsion. That's the word. Paul had this agitator. The Holy Ghost in him was motivating him. He could not go without telling people about Jesus. He woke up talking to the Lord and talking to people about the Lord. Why? Because he loved the Lord and he loved people and he wanted to tell people about Jesus. He was agitated. He was, there was this compulsion. He had to do it. And guess what? If you're saved, you have that same Holy Ghost in you and he is agitating you. You know that you should be telling people about Jesus. I'm not here to put any guilt on you. I just want to motivate you a little bit. Let me give you five things very quickly that ought to motivate you. And these are not original with me. And guess what? I don't know where it came from and you don't either. I've heard four or five people claim it. You know what? Somebody's telling a story. Amen. I'm just telling Everybody didn't come up with this, all right? 
So I don't know who came up with it. And if you think you know who it was, don't say anything because they didn't come up with it, all right? So I don't know where it came from. I just love it. And uh, I'm going to preach it. And because God gave it to somebody, and it really doesn't matter, but here it goes. The first thing that ought to motivate you is this, the downstretched hands of God. The downstretched hands of God. God loves everybody. Amen belongs there. God loves everybody. I believe I've read that somewhere. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loves all the people in the world. God doesn't just love some people. God loves everybody. And whoever, whoever believes in him shall be saved. God wants everybody everywhere to repent. That's what Paul said when he was preaching in Acts chapter 17. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. There is not a person that God doesn't want to be saved. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. When you, the next time you're around somebody and you say, you know, I, I just feel like I ought to witness to them. Number one, that is always the Holy Spirit. Because you're too sinful for that to be you. And the devil's not telling you to witness to somebody, all right? Any, any prompting to witness is from the Holy Ghost. Any prompting, by the way, any prompting to give is by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will constantly tell you to give things to people and to do it in a way that God gets all the glory. And what you got to do is you got to understand you're too selfish for that to be you. And the devil's not telling you to give somebody something, all right? So just go on and do it before you talk yourself out of it. Amen? Amen. So, so here, here he is. The, the love of God, the love of God will prompt you to tell other people about Jesus. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the downstretched hands of God. God wants people to get saved. He will not force people to be saved, but he wants people to be saved. God's hands are reaching down to you right now. If you don't know Jesus, I'm telling you, Jesus Christ loves you. He wants to save you. And if you want to be saved, you can leave here tonight a changed individual. You can have the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, all of your guilt washed away through the Lord Jesus Christ because God's hands reach down for everyone. The downstretched hands of God. The second thing that can motivate you to be a witness for Jesus Christ are the outstretched hands of man. And what I mean by this is people, there are people out there that are open to the gospel. Not everybody is, but some are. The Bible talks about Jesus telling about the parable of the sower. And he talks about the kind of seed. The seed was the same, but he, the kind of soil, rather, that was, it was going to fall on. Some of it's hard. Some of it is, you know, in shallow ground. Some of it's in the thorns. Ah, oh, but there's good soil. You know what? You don't know what kind of soil it is out there. It's not your job to test the soil before you sow the seed. It is your job to sow the seed. Look at me. And the more seed you sow, the bigger the harvest is going to be. You will reap proportionately according to your sowing. That is just a biblical principle in everything. It is with money. It is with gospel preaching. It is with anything else. The more we share the gospel, the more people get saved. And so the, the Bible says that there are people out there with outstretched arms. They're hungry. A lot of people don't even know what they're hungry for. They, they, they try illicit sex. They try drugs. They try all these things. They try positions and power and getting in shape and all these other things. But nothing can satisfy your soul except the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about the Ethiopian eunuch. Was he open or what? Here you've got Philip, a deacon who was involved in this great ministry 
this great revival that's taking place in Samaria. And God says, leave that. Sometimes God will have you leave something that is hot. I mean, that is really moving for God. He'll have you, he'll just pull you right out of that and take you down on a desert road. You know what? The bottom line, it doesn't really matter where God puts you. You ought to be private gains or whatever your name is, private gains reporting for duty. Wherever you want me to go, if you want me to go to a desert road, if you want me to go to Bellevue, if you want me to go somewhere else, that's fine. Because it really doesn't matter. I'm just reporting for duty every day. And so here's this deacon. He goes off down on this desert road and he's running beside a chariot. Now, you know, I would like to see any deacon doing that. Amen. Just, just go going out there. Some of you deacons do that this Sunday. Go find a chariot and run by it. And if a guy's reading uh, the, the Bible, if he's reading Isaiah and, and, and God, God's wanting you to witness to him. I just want you to know that, all right? This man was open. The Bible says Philip ran up, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. He was reading from Isaiah 53, which is the epicenter of the gospel in the Old Testament. And the Bible says, Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And listen to this guy's end. You, you think his arms are open? Listen to this. You think his heart is open? Well, how could I unless somebody explained it to me? Green light, green light, green light. You think maybe God had set this thing up? I want to say this to you. When God's laying it on your heart to witness, God's laying on their heart to listen. And so he gets up in there, leads the guy to Christ, baptizes him, and, and whoosh, the Holy Ghost takes Philip off, and this guy goes back. And every time I go to Israel and I see those Ethiopian Christians, I thank God for a deacon that would be obedient to the Holy Spirit of God and witness to people who are lost. There are other people in the Bible that talk about in the book of Acts, Cornelius, oh, he was so open. The Bible says when Peter came to him, he said, now then, we're all here present before God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. There are people out there all around you where you work, or in your neighborhood, where you go to, to go to school, whatever it might, in your family, there are people that are open to the gospel. If you would just open your mouth, open your heart and talk about Jesus, brag on Jesus, God will give you a gospel green light. And then there are other people, like I talked about a while ago, the Philippian jailers, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You may not, everybody may not be that way, but there's some good soil out there. And I wanna tell you what motivates me. When I start thinking about sharing the gospel, I just remember that if I will sow gospel seed, God will help all of those people hear the gospel, but there will be a gospel harvest that will be reaped. The more seed I sow, the larger the harvest. I want to, I want to be motivated by the outstretched hands of people. The third motivation is this, the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. That ought to motivate you, had it not? Now we've got a Savior, do we not? Didn't we hear a great song, Oh, what a Savior? There would be no saving were it not for the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the good news. Jesus is the euangelion. He is what evangelism is all about. He is the evangel. He is the message and the messenger. Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, came to this earth, born of a virgin, free from a sinful nature. He lived a sinless life. He died then on a cross, not for his sins. He didn't have any. He died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And the Bible says he stayed on that cross until he could say, it is finished. To tell us die, paid in full. I don't have any jewelry. I've got two pieces of jewelry, a watch, that aggravates me a lot of time. It's buzzing all the time. It's one of these watches that's hooked up to my computer and everything, but I like it because it keeps perfect time. But then I've got a ring I never take off. It's my wedding ring, and I'm glad. I want everybody to know that I am married, not that anybody would want me, but I'm just saying bottom line is, even if they did, they can't have me because I'm, I'm married to, to the woman I want. And so I wear this, all I got, but then I've got two rubber bands on my hand. That's it. That's all my jewelry. I don't need a case for all my jewelry. I just put it in one little spot. And these rubber bands say men of Memphis, that's our men's ministry, but the other one has, I have a band on my arm that says Tetelestai. You know why? Paid in full. Paid in full. It is finished. Aren't you glad that Jesus went to the cross and died and bore all your sins on the cross? Let's thank him right now. Let's praise him. Let's worship him right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
1 John 2 says it this way. John, by the way, was at the cross. He was one of the few that didn't run. He's there with Mary. Remember what Jesus said? Woman, behold your new son. Son, man, behold your new mother. That was John. And John said this about the cross. 1 John chapter 1, verses 2, 1 and 2. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate. We have a, a go-between. We have a, a liaison. We have a lawyer, literally, literally. We have an attorney and, and with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation. That's a fancy word for the atoning sacrifice. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Jesus didn't die just for a few people's sins. Jesus died for everybody's sins. Jesus died for your sins, those sins that nobody knows about except you and him. Jesus died for all your sins. That ought to motivate you. Man, if you're a Christian and all your sins have been washed away, you ought to thank God, yes. You ought to sing and praise God, yes. But you ought to tell other people how they can have their sins washed away, how they can be right with God, how they can have all that stuff. I want to say this to you. God won't just forgive your sin. God will go on through the blood of Jesus and set you free from sinful strongholds that you've had for years. God is a powerful God and the blood of Jesus cleanses us, I love this, from all iniquity. All iniquity. Let that motivate you, the nail-scarred hands of Jesus. Very quickly, the fourth thing is this. A fourth thing that should motivate every Christian to share the gospel with lost people is this, the blood-stained hands of Christians. Paul was trying to make it back to Jerusalem before Pentecost on one of his missionary journeys. And he stops off at a little place called Miletus, right on the edge of the sea. And he calls out, somehow he gets word out to the elders, the pastors up at Ephesus, and they all come out. Paul starts talking to them about his ministry and he'll never see them again. One of the things he said, though, in Acts chapter 20, verses 6, 26 through 27 is this. Therefore, I testify to you today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. In other words, I told everybody I saw about Jesus Christ. I have people say, Brother Steve, I wonder if I should witness these people. I wonder, how do I know if the Lord is telling me to witness? I think maybe what we ought to do is go ahead and witness whether the Lord, we feel like the Lord tells us to or not. You know, I, I just think that Paul said, you know what? If you're breathing, I'm going to talk to you about Jesus. If you're not breathing, I'm going to try to raise you from the dead so I can talk to you about Jesus, all right? And if you're somewhere in between, I'm still going to tell you about Jesus. Paul said, I, I, I'm going to tell you, about, I don't have any blood on my hands. I don't have any. The Bible says that when they went to Ephesus, he started telling people about Jesus. And it says in Acts 19 verse 10, this took place for two years, him telling people about Jesus, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. I don't have, we've got about a thousand, maybe more than that here tonight, maybe 2,000, I don't know what it is. But I want to say this to you. If all the people in this room just told one or two people a week about the Lord Jesus, this town would be changed. This whole area would be changed. And the Bible says if people die they come around you and they never hear the gospel and they die in that state. They go to hell, but their blood is on your hands. It's on your hands. You say, I don't believe that. I'll tell you where he got it. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. Son of man, God said to Ezekiel, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you don't warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that he may live, that wicked man shall surely die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you have warned the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. I want to ask you, you're all going to die Last time I checked, 
Everybody dies. You say, I'm waiting on the rapture. I am too. I'm looking for the rapture, but you know what? I might die before the rapture comes. And I want to say this to you. Even if the rapture comes, you're still going to stand before God and give an account of your life. And there's going to be people there that you could have and should have witnessed to. But you were so wrapped up in your own deal. That, that's the deal. That's, that's what's keeping us from witnessing right there. We're so wrapped up in ourselves. We're just so wrapped up in our deal. Our money. Our career. Our family. Our this. Our that. Our little church. Oh, we just, we just, you know, I know some churches. Oh, we just want to, you know, just want to keep our little church. Let's just minister to our church. And everybody around them needs to hear the gospel. I want to say this to you. When you stand before God, there's going to be no excuses. God gave you the gospel. He gave you the gospel not to hoard, but to share. If you got something good, don't you want to share it? I mean, if you know some good news, don't you want to tell it? That's all I'm talking about. Oh, don't stand before God with blood on your hands. But there's one more thing, and to me, it's the greatest motivation of all. Oh, I thank God for the downstretched hands of God. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. The outstretched hands of man. What must I do to be saved? How can I know unless somebody explains it to me? We're all here standing, waiting to hear the word that God has given you. Thank God for the outstretched hands of man. Thank God for the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, that he is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. And oh, I'm afraid of those blood-stained hands. I don't, I don't want to have blood on my hands when I stand before God. All that's fine. But to me, all of that is not as sobering as this last thing, and that is the upstretched hands of hell. Hell is real. Read the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Jesus talked about hell all the time. And Jesus, we don't, we don't have, I have people say, what is hell like? We don't have to wonder. Jesus opened the door in Luke 16 and, and showed us what it is. Talks about two men. Now there was a rich man. He habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day, and a poor man named Lazarus. This is not Lazarus of Bethany. This is not Mary and Martha's brother that was raised from the dead. This is another Lazarus. A man named Lazarus, a poor man, was laid at his gate, covered with sores, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. You know what that was? They didn't have napkins back then. They would wipe their hands on bread after they ate, and all their, their slobber and everything else was all of that bread, and they'd throw, it under, they'd throw it under a table, and that bread was eaten by dogs, and then they would throw it out in the garbage, and the poor people would eat it. That's what he's talking about. He was longing for the scraps from this rich man's table. And besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died, and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man died also and was buried. No angels for the rich man. In Hades, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment. He saw Abraham far away, Lazarus in his bosom. He cried out, and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. And cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus his bad things. But now there's this, been this big reversal. He is being comforted here and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, between heaven and hell, there's a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over there from here to there, from heaven to hell, will not be able to and that none may cross over from there, from hell to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, all of a sudden this man's a soul winner, wants to be, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, oh, 
They have Moses and the prophets. They have the Old Testament scriptures. They're read every week in the synagogue. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they don't listen to the prophets and Moses, if they don't listen to the scriptures, they will not be persuaded. Even if someone rises from the dead and Jesus is saying, They didn't listen to the Old Testament and they're not going to listen to me either. That man is in hell right now. He's been in hell. I don't know when he went to hell, but it was at least by the time Jesus was alive. That's not a little story. That's not a little parable. That is us getting to look into hell. And I'll be frank with you. I know about you, but that motivates me. I pray for about about 15 lost people every day. I pray that they will be convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. John 16, verse 8. I pray that they will call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Romans 10, 13. I pray that they will repent and return, that their sins may be washed away, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord into their lives. And that's out of Acts chapter 2, verse 19. And you say, it's not right to pray for lost people. Paul said, my heart's desire and my prayer for them is for their salvation. Do you have a list? Do you have names that you're praying that God will convict them and convert them and send them a contact, and are you willing to be that contact? If you, if somebody asked you right now, what must I do to be saved? Are you ready to tell them? Look, if you got saved, you know. If you don't know, maybe you've never been saved. Oh, you know it. The bottom line is, can you articulate that? Can you share that? Can you say, look, here's the gospel. God loves everybody. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But we are all sinners. And the wages, the just penalty of sin is death. And it separates from God, us from God. But God loved us too much to leave us in that state of separation. So when we couldn't get to God, here's the gospel. Every other religion is working your way up to God, working your way up to God, doing these good works, doing this kind of stuff. God says, you'll never get here, so I'm going to come to you. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to pull you out of the miry clay. I'm going to set your feet on a rock. I'm going to put a new song in your heart, a song of praise to your God. And so when God saw us trying to make our way up, trying to sow our fig leaves together, trying to do our good works, God said, that's not going to work. So he came down in his son, Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God, Jesus Christ, the eternal word of God. He who knew no sin came to this world by the womb of a virgin. He stepped onto this earth through Mary. And the Bible says he lived a sinless life. And then he went to the cross and he died for you and he bore your sin and every sin, every rotten thing you've ever done, everything you've ever thought or said that was not of God was placed on Jesus in one putrid mass. And the Bible says that God literally poured out the wrath of God upon Jesus and he drank the cup of the wrath of God and turned that horrible chalice over and said, it is finished, and he was buried. But I want to tell you, God raised him from the dead, and he is alive. He's alive. Buddha is dead. Muhammad is dead. If the hero of your holy book is dead, that's not much of a hero, is it? But Jesus, I had been preaching for 40 years about some dead man. I've been preaching about man that came out of the grave with the keys. I like to be around the guy with the keys, don't you? That's the guy that gets something right there. He can get anywhere he wants to. Jesus came out with the keys and he rose from the dead bodily, victoriously, and eternally from the grave. And now he offers you eternal life. How do you receive it? How do you get it? First of all, you repent. You don't repent, you go to hell. That's what Jesus said twice. He said that in Luke 13. Repent, here it is. I'll show you repent. You ready? I'm going along doing my thing. I don't care about God. I don't care about church. I I don't really know about prayer. All of a sudden I get convicted by the Holy Spirit. Somebody shares the gospel with me and I realize I'm a lost sinner. I can't do this on my own. I gotta be saved. I gotta have God. I I know that I need something. I know that something's missing. 
And now they're telling me it's Jesus. I said, okay, that's what I want. So I do an about face. I do a 180. I do a U-turn. I had a guy tell me one day, he said, oh, Brother Steve, Brother Steve, I got saved. I did a 360 for Jesus. I said, oh, man, don't do that. We've had too many people do that. Amen. Do a 180, all right? Do an about face. And all of a sudden, how many of you ever done an about face for Jesus? Amen. You've turned from your sin. You turn from your sin and you turn to God. And then you've got to believe. What do you have to believe? You have to believe that Jesus died for you. You have to personalize this. And you have to believe that Jesus rose from the dead to give you eternal life. You, you, listen, you kids out there, just because you come to this church doesn't mean you're saved. Just because your parents are saved doesn't mean you're saved. Parents, don't you dare think that just because you bring your kids to church, they're all saved. Oh, no. No, no, no. Everybody has to embrace Jesus for himself. You have to repent and you have to believe that Jesus died on the cross and bore your sins and rose from the dead to give you eternal life. And then you have to receive, you have to invite. It's the Greek word lambano. You have to accept Jesus into your life at a moment in time. And when you do that, you become a new creation. And that's what keeps you out of hell. That's what keeps you out of hell. You need some motivation tonight. How about the downstretched hands of God? Can you see them? Just shut your eyes just a minute. Can can you see those lost people? Can you see those lost relatives? They're crying out for something. They don't know what it is. That neighbor you've got that's such a pain, you need to start seeing them as eternal souls. They're reaching out. You got the answer. Does that motivate you? What about the nail-scarred hands of Jesus? Jesus loved them so much, he stayed on the cross until he could say, to tell us, died, it's finished. Do you love them that much? Does that motivate you? Does the cross motivate you for people to be saved? Well, what about, what about the blood-stained hands of Christians that don't tell anybody about Jesus? How's that going to work for you at the judgment? And what about the upstretched hands of hell? If you're lost today, please give your heart to Christ tonight. If you're saved, please. Even if you're a preacher, staff member, please start sharing the gospel. Ask God to give you opportunities and he will. And then do it. My friend, I stand in judgment now. And I feel that you're to blame somehow. On earth I walked with you by day. Never once did you point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never once did you tell the old, old story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me straight to him. Though we lived together on the earth, you never once told me of the second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things, that's true. I called you friend, I trusted you. But I have learned now that it's too late. You could have saved me from this horrible fate. We walked by day, we talked by night, and you never once showed me gospel light. You let me live and you let me die. You never told me I could live on high. I called you friend in life. We laughed through joy and pain and strife, and yet, now that I have come to this wretched end, I cannot call you friend. Oh God, I ask in Jesus' name that you would open our hearts and help us have a burden for lost people. And Lord, I, I pray more than that. I pray for a love for lost people. Motivate us, Lord. Holy Spirit, agitate us. Compel us to tell people about Jesus. Jesus.